And Pete, in, in this book, when considering what prayer is, says this. He says, it is the unending chorus of human longing, canticle of sighs and cries and chiming bells, mutterings in maternity wards, celestial oratorias, and scribbled graffiti. What Pete is describing is this natural urge in all humanity to pray. Pray in a variety of ways, for sure. But we all seem to want to and desire to pray. There's something in us that calls out talking and speaking, whether it's out loud or in our minds, to someone. And I say all of this because it's important for us to have a baseline when it comes to the topic and conversation of prayer. We need to have a baseline of what this looks like. And the baseline is that all of humanity, no matter what religion, no matter what walk of life, no matter anti-religion, all of humanity in one way or another cries out in prayer. And I find sometimes when we talk about prayer, we come to it from a variety of life experiences, especially those of us that find ourselves in the church. We come to it with a variety of experiences of prayer. Some of us come to prayer with, well, I used to do that. I used to pray all the time. I used to pray before bed, before meals. I, I prayed in school. I used to do it all the time, but it just didn't work. So I stopped. Or maybe your experience is we, we approach prayer from a way of thinking that I don't even know what the point of prayer is anymore. I mean, the world just keeps turning, life keeps happening, nothing changes, so what is even the point? Or maybe you find yourself in a different side of thinking, in a place where you have prayed and something happened. Something that's hard to explain, and maybe you can, you can find ways to explain it, but it seems that prayer worked. Believe it or not, all of these experiences, all of these ways of coming to prayer and more are all found in the Bible, are all found in our scriptures. Authors frustrated, angry at un unanswered prayers. Authors in dismay at what is the point of it all after the good suffer and the bad succeed, the greedy get their way and the humble and meek get trotted on. What's even the point? And of course, as well, we find biblical authors who rejoice in the care and help they have received. Our Bible is filled with collections of honest human interactions with God. Why is humanity's baseline prayer? Why is it that we all desire to be known, to be seen, to be heard? Why is it that we constantly cry into the void, to God, to someone? So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to Luke 11 or log in on your app to Luke 11. And we're going to look at a, starting in verse 1. Verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So the first thing we need to notice in, right away is in verse 1 is before Jesus even teaches anything or before the disciples even ask, there's actually a posture here. Jesus sets an example to pray. The whole conversation begins out of the fact that Jesus prays. That Jesus' baseline is the same as ours. That Jesus takes the time in his day to pray. So please don't hear me wrong. It is biblical to pray without ceasing, to swirl your thoughts, to be talking all the time to God. But there is something significant Jesus sets in an example to have a place set apart. He went somewhere to pray. And then his disciples, his students, his closest people noticed it. So let's keep reading. Jesus, he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. So one thing to note comparing this prayer to Matthew's recollection of the same prayer is that this prayer is a little bit shorter, right? It is. And, it's, and it seems a bit more informal in its tone as well. It starts very similar with this deep um, connection to this intimacy of a parent. But what I find fascinating, without breaking this prayer too much down, what I find really interesting is for Luke, in his version of the events, he does this shorter informal prayer, 
And then he just immediately jumps into this parable. He, t- he just jumps right into this little story. And I find it so fascinating. So let's keep reading and find out what he says. So he teaches them a little prayer. And then he says immediately, Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, let me lend me three loaves of bread. And a friend of mine on a, friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is locked, and my children and I are in bed, and I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Jesus continues, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. This is probably the hardest for me. This is probably the hardest part of this parable and this prayer posture that Jesus is tying right to his short little prayer. Because these verses isolated on their own can be exciting, but also so, so frustrating. They seem to present this formulaic approach to prayer. If you just knock, if you just ask, you'll receive, right? But that just doesn't seem right to us. It doesn't seem to be true based on our experiences. Let's keep reading. Which of you fathers, if your son asks you for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, this is interesting to me. Jesus turns the disciples and our attention by ending the parable where the prayer started with intimate relationship between the parent and a child. Notice that the parables are expressing close and far relationships, how the, how the presence of people in our relationships dictate our actions. The closer something to us is, our neighbor, an event, the closer it is to us, we know how to reply, how to step into those moments, even though we are evil, broken, messy. We know how to be a host, how to be a parent. Then how much more will God So ask, knock, and you will receive, right? Easy. But again, something doesn't quite add up. Many of us here have asked, have pleaded, and have not received that which we would wish. But doesn't Jesus say, if you ask, you shall receive? What's even the point if he doesn't come through? What gives? Shortly after my father's funeral, I was rereading this text from Luke 11. And in a moment of grieving and praying through it over and over, this part of the verse jumped out at me. How much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see, so often I have have stopped at ask and you shall receive. Instead of giving us exactly what we're asking for, Jesus seems to promise his Holy Spirit. Jesus promises his presence. And it's hard to know, if I'm honest, what to do with that sometimes. What to do with this promise. Until, of course, I need to be heard, known, and seen. You see, Jesus promises that which we were made for, our relationship with God himself. In our prayers to God, we do not find one who is not interested in hosting us. We do not find a locked door. We do not find stale bread. We find one waiting for us, anticipating us, a God who hears us, answers us, forgives us, one who loves us, God who is faithful to his promise who gives us his Holy Spirit and invites us into his presence. 
And in his presence, we find hope, rest, joy, and peace. We are invited into eternal realities of grace and love here and now in the intimate embrace of God's community.